Welcome to Blog Talk Radio in high fidelity. Welcome and thank you for tuning into In the Arms of the Angels, hosted by Dr. Kai McNeil on Spiritual Connections Radio. Hey everybody, it's uh, Mark Rawson, and I'm really excited to have you on the show this evening. Uh, the show, of course, is In the Arms of the Angels with uh, Dr. Connie McNeil, and we have a very special show that we're doing this evening. The show this evening, we're actually going to be interviewing um, our friend who's been on the show on Spiritual Connections Radio for the last four years, uh, and that's Garnet Schuhauser. And um, he's going to be on this evening to talk about his latest book. Um, it's kind of a traditional thing. Uh, ever since I, I had a chance to get introduced to his material, um, we've interviewed him for every book that he's ever released. And we're really excited that his new book is coming out. And, um, you know, we'll be talking a lot about, you know, his different books, his work, and, and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, um, I, I just ask everybody to bear with me. I'm having a little bit of trouble with a switchboard this evening, so let me just kind of do a check-in here. Garnet, are you with us? All right, hold on. I'm not hearing anybody. Hold on. Like I said, I'm having all kinds of fun tonight. Let's see if I can get uh, everybody cut over. All right, Dr. Connie, are you on? I'm here. All right, we got one of them. Garnet, are you on? Yep. Hear me? Nope, yeah, there you here. go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. The energy this evening is off the charts. Uh, my switchboard is all over the place, and uh, the spirits and everything are really playing with stuff this evening. <laughs> Well, we, of course, we have Dr. Connie, uh, who's on this evening, and uh, we have our guest on and everything like that. So uh, now that I got everybody on the air, um, we can go ahead and get the show started. So, um, you know, let's just start from the beginning, because I, I love to hear the story. Garnet, why don't you talk about, you know, how you got started and, you know, how you met your guide and, and just kind of go from there. Well, way back when, as a child, I was raised as a Roman Catholic in a very strict religious family. Um, and I, was, I served as an altar boy and did all those things that good Catholic boys did. But when I hit, got off to college and hit to my 20s and 30s, I began to have a lot of doubts about some of the, the, the beliefs and the dogmas of the Catholic Church. And so um, one by one, I sort of dismissed a lot of them. And then I was casting about for a new paradigm to latch onto, uh, sort of a no man's land. And... Uh, I constantly ask myself the, the, the eternal questions of life that everyone does once in a while, like, who am I, why am I here, you know, what's my life purpose, and what happens to me when I die? Um, and so um, I, was, uh, I practiced law for, for quite a while, uh, uh, for like 34 years or so, and um, the, the, the transformation came when I was still practicing law back in 2007, and I was strolling down the street one day, um, and all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, a homeless man jumped in front of me and just stopped me in my tracks. And he looked like a typical homeless man with his long stringy hair and a scraggly beard and dirty slept in clothes. Uh, um, but there's something different about this guy, which, which made me stand there and not sort of walk around him as I typically would with the, these people who I met often on the street. He had these amazing, dazzling, sparkling blue eyes, um, and they, they seemed to be doing two things at the same time. First of all, his gaze seemed to be penetrating deep within me, right down to the depths of my soul. And I sensed and I felt that he knew everything about me, everything I'd ever said or done, all my hopes and aspirations, and my, and my, and my fears and, uh, and, and, uh, 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 and doubts, um, and all my deepest and darkest secrets. He knew everything about me, even though we'd never met before, so I wasn't sure how this all happened. But I didn't feel violated because at the same time, his gaze was sending me this wave of pure, unconditional love that was infusing my whole body with an amazing sense of peace, security, and well-being. So I just stood there basking in the gaze of this man, feeling very wonderful. Uh, it was like I was in a time warp. And then he eventually broke the spell by saying to me, why are you here? And he promptly disappeared into a nearby store. But when I finally collected my wits, I went into the store to try to find him. I really had to know who he was and why he'd stopped me. But I, I looked up and down everywhere in the store, and he was nowhere to be seen. 
I walked back out on the street, walked up and down for several blocks trying to spot him, but he had seemingly disappeared into thin air. So I walked back to my office and I resolved the, that night that I needed to go back to the street the next day to see if I could find this man. And so I did. Next day, same time, same street. Um, I started, uh, you know, walking up and down, trying to frantically looking for him, trying to trying to find him, trying to spot him. Eventually, I saw him sitting all alone on a bench. So I went up to him and I said, "Who are you and why did you stop me the other day?" And he said, "Ah, I'm a soul just like you. I'm here to help you on your journey and to answer your questions." And then, unfortunately, my skeptical lawyer brain kicked in and I said to him. Why do you think you can help me when you can't even help yourself? Because you look like you've been sleeping on the street for weeks and you smell like a dead fish. Well, he just gave me a big smile and he said, you know, looks can be deceiving because you look like you're a very successful lawyer with everything under control, but we both know that's just a facade. He said, you can turn around and go back to your office and see if you can find the answers you've been seeking all these years on all those emails waiting for you on your computer or you can sit down and have a chat with me. So luckily my intuition was screaming at me that I needed to sit down and find out more about this man. And after all, what did I have to lose? A half an hour of my life. So I sat down and we began a dialogue that went off and on for the next few months. And I found out his name was Albert and he was really one of my spirit guides in disguise. And he told me that I was the only person who could see him in physical form. So if other people had been passing the bench that day, they would have seen me sitting all by myself, talking to myself, because they couldn't see him. And so he appeared to me in physical form for the first three uh, encounters, and then after that, he was just a voice in my head, and we communicated by telepathy. And, and when I said to him, well, why did you show up initially as a homeless man? He said, well, if I'd suddenly started talking to you as a voice in your head out of the blue, you likely would have thought you were losing your mind. So this was his way of easing me into the conversation, which was quite effective, actually. It worked very well. And so... Um, he answered all the questions, the big questions in life and many others, and we had this dialogue that went off and on, as I said, for several months. And then he told me um, at some point that uh, he wasn't here to just satisfy my curiosity. He wanted me to write a book about his revelations, which surprised me because I'd never even, never even occurred to me ever to, to write a book. I was a bit reluctant, but eventually he persuaded me to do so, and that resulted in uh, my first book, Dancing on a Stamp. And then after the, the, we had our first conversation uh, um, that, that, that got uh, described in my first book, he then appeared in my life again in a, quite a bit of a different fashion. He, uh, I was asleep at, at night in my bed, and I woke up and I saw this ghost-like ethereal figure standing in the doorway of my bedroom. And when it moved closer to me, I could see it was my old friend Albert. Now he was in astral form. And he said he had come to take me on a series of astral trips to the spirit side, to other places in the universe, other places in our planet, because he wanted me to uh, write about what I saw and what I heard and about the people I met in my next book. And so then he literally grabbed my, my hand and pulled my, my astral hand, pulled my astral body out of my physical body, which was still sound asleep in bed, and we just rose up through the ceiling and up through the clouds, and we began our first astral adventure. And so the, the next three books that I've written, um, Dancing Forever with Spirit, Dance of Heavenly Bliss, and this new one, Dance of Eternal Rapture, all describe my various astral adventures with my spirit guide, Albert. Wow, that's, that's, that's such a beautiful story. I've heard it quite a few times, but I tell you, I never get sick of hearing it. Um, you know, I, I think for most of our listeners and everybody that's tuned in, I mean, who wouldn't want to meet their, their guide face-to-face, -face? and especially if they actually showed up in physical form um you know i think it would require for most of us even us spiritual people i think our guide would actually have to show up in in a physical form that was you know um wouldn't be scary to us because i know i had one experience once where i was woken up in the middle of the night and looked off to the side of my bed and saw this energy form of light moving across you know towards me and you know, even with the fact that I have a lot of spiritual teaching and background, it scared me, <laughs> you know, because you're like, I don't normally physically see things. You know, I, I get lots of other gifts and, you know, I kind of see a lot of other things and I know things that way. But I've never actually, there's not too many times in my life that I physically have seen things manifest. So, I, you know, I guess to get some of the questions started, we'll kick it over to Connie in a second. Um, 
Does everybody have a guide, Garnet? Absolutely. Everyone has at least two or three. Some have 10 or 12. It depends on the person. And, and they're with you 24-7. They're with you all the time. They're like your coaches. They're there to try to help you, send you messages to, to get you on the right path, the right path being the one that you'd hoped to, to experience before you were born. And so they're always there for you, and they're very, they're very uh, uh, caring and loving. And, and uh, you know, the, the unfortunate thing is they, they, they don't always manifest themselves to, to people physically. It's very rare, like that what Albert did to me. But they're always there sending you messages, and it's, uh, and, and it's really a, a joy for them. I mean, in, in, in many cases, um, you know, a person's spirit guides is somebody that they've incarnated with before in previous lives, uh, or maybe even somebody they've known in this life who's now passed on. Uh, so it's really a great, it, it's really comforting to know you've always got a team there that's there all the time with you uh, and trying to help you out on your journey. So yeah, everyone, everyone has them. They, they actually change, they can change uh, over your lifetime, Mark. Uh, uh, you know, some, depending on your needs as you advance through life, your spirit guides may change as well. Uh, so that you know, when you hit a certain segment, the, a new guide may come in, may come in that has more experience in the uh, dealing with the particular challenges that you will be facing in, for that segment. So they do change. Some of them will stay with you from you know from day one when you're born right through until you die. So it's uh, it's, it's very comforting knowledge to me anyway that uh, that we all have these guides. You know, you you had said at a certain point that um, the guides, uh, you know, or I should say, your guide, he he stopped appearing to you where you could visually see him, and he was more of uh, in your head, and you could actually telepathically talk to him. Um, I've I've kind of heard that from a lot of different teachers that our guides talk to us a lot, and lots of times until we get discernment about it. We can't really even tell the difference between our guides giving us some guidance and our own internal thoughts in our head. Uh, you, do you have any kind of comment about that? Yeah, that's very typical, uh, Mark. That happens with uh, most people, um, and it did with me as well before I met Albert. Um, you, you know, the, the, the messages you get from your guides are very subtle. It's like uh, flashes of intuition, uh, gut feelings, whispers in your mind. Sometimes it's external things like coincidental events. You know that they're all designed to get your attention, to tell you that there's some message there for you to discern and, and hopefully follow. But most of us have, <coughs> excuse me, so many, <coughs> excuse me, so many thoughts crowded in our minds, you know, throughout the day, that it's hard to pick these messages from our guides out and understand what they are and, and who they're coming from and what we should do about them. And so it, it's very difficult. Um, and, and the best way that Albert said is that, hey, look at you know. Not everyone's going to have a spirit guide show up as a, in physical form for them. It's not intended for everyone to have that. Uh, one of the challenges that we have in our journey on Earth is to be able to try to discern what our guides are telling us. And he says the best way is just by sitting quietly in a room, uh, meditating, trying to get rid of all the other clutter from your mind. And then if you can do this, you can slowly but surely start to hear the messages from your guides come through. And the more you hear them, the better you are able to discern them from all the other thoughts that that uh, that race through your mind every day. So it's not an easy job; wasn't intended to be, but it's something that we can all do and, and become better at. Very, very cool, Dr. Connie. Do you have a question? Um, I don't know if it's a question, but I certainly have a comment. I was very intrigued when you said that the guides change um, depending on where you're at and what you might be going through. Um, with my own self, it's very easy for me to to have visualizations when when I'm meditating, and I have seen different people come in, and I hadn't really associated them. I I had kind of associated them as as being helpers, but I had never really connected with that they were actually my guide at that time, because it was be, it would be somebody all of a sudden I would start thinking about that I hadn't not much about before, and then I would start seeing them in my visualizations, and then certain things that I would uh, hear about this person, it, it would, would resonate with me. So um, I'm, I, I, I very much appreciate you, you bringing up that comment that we have, um, you know, different guides at different times. Um, yeah, and that, that's sort of, a, uh, that's indicative of why you would see different people in your visions, not the same one all the time, because maybe you have different guides that are coming into your life. And, and but, but you do also have more than one guide typically, so they may be taking turns coming into your into your visions. 
Right. Yeah, I do. I kind of see a few. There are a few that are, are that are um, um, that stay all the time, and I'm sure a lot of us do. And then, but there'll be people that will come in and out. So again, I'm I'm really intrigued with that. Um, what what do you think that Albert's main message is? If you you know, if you could just zing it out there to to the folks listening tonight about um, if if you if I don't even know if you could put all this kind of in a in a base platform as to as to what his base message would be. His base message is that he says, "Look, at you're all eternal souls. You live forever. You're just having a, a human journey on planet Earth, um, you, and you chose to come here." You chose that yourself before you incarnated. No one made you came here. Uh, no one told you where you had to be born or what your life was to be about. You chose that for yourself so that you can grow and evolve as a soul. That's just that's what we all try to do. So when you, when you look in the mirror and you say, why am I here? The short answer is because I chose to come here, which, of course, we don't get to remember. And so, um, you know, when we have that understanding is, is that we, we came here because of our own choice and we came here to experience certain challenges and learn certain things, then we can no longer think ourselves as being the victim because it's not the universe or God doing something to us. It's because we chose to come here and we have free will to act once we get here. And so we basically create our own reality as we move along. We're following a script and we're writing it as we go. Um, and so it, it's, if, you, if you look at life in that sense, he says, you know, life is, it should be looked at as an adventure. You came here, it's a very short period of time. On the spirit side, there isn't any linear time like we have here. And so an 80-year life on earth is like the blink of an eye to a soul on the spirit side. So it's a very short little soldier and away from the, 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 the beauty of the spirit side to come here to learn and experience things. And so he says it's an adventure. He said, you know, don't take things so seriously. Lighten up. You know, smile a lot, laugh a lot, and know that no matter what you do, uh, no matter how wrong, how many mistakes you make or how many wrong turns you take, you're always going to end up back on the spirit side. So think, think of it as an adventure. So that's sort of, to me, is uh, that's probably how to sum it up. I mean, he said a lot of other things about the details about life on Earth and how we get there and how we, what we do to, to incarnate and how our planning and so on. But the core message is that look at, you know, don't take it so seriously. You're always going to end up back where you came from, and in the meantime, you're having an adventure to learn and experience things. Very, very cool. That Thank so, you. Yeah, that is so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So, Garnet, I, I guess you know one of the questions I have for you because I was kind of listening to you, and you said, you know, we're kind of here writing our own script and you know stuff like that, and. I think, you know, one of the big questions that always seems to come up across spiritual groups, no matter what the spiritual practice is, is just the question on how much of life is actually kind of planned out like milestones that we're supposed to achieve and how much of it is just just free will. You know, are we actually on autopilot in a process of things that we had planned and our only um, ability to... Um, experience it is just to decide what we want to do with each experience as it comes or are we actually writing the script well it's a combination of things um, in your life plan you set out the sort of the major factors at, at the beginning of your life things like the place you're going to be born uh, the identity of your parents and your siblings uh, the first language you learn those things once you come into this life those things are already set you can't change those but but you also set in your life plan other milestones like you know the, the the first job you'd get, uh, you know, the, the person you're going to have as your spouse, various other milestones. But it's a bit of a crapshoot because you have free will to act in, uh, when you get here and you don't remember what you had planned, so you will quite often go off course. And sometimes you'll hit you know, quite a few of the milestones, sometimes you'll hit very few of them. Um, but it doesn't really matter because it, it's, uh, you know, wh whatever experience you have on earth, w whether you hit your points or not, is still a learning lesson for you. So it's really a combination of the two. Some things... Uh, are, are you know your milestones you just set out your guides are, are, are always whispering in your ear when you come to a decision point to say you know take the left fork not the right fork they're always trying to tell you that and if you sort of listen to that guidance you're going to hit your milestones if you if you don't hear that or if your mind decides that you don't really want to do that you're going to go off and take the other fork and and so you're off in a tangent so it's your, your life is certainly not etched in stone it's not uh, fatalism by any stretch 
Um, and, you know, as I say, it depends on how well you listen to your guides as to whether you hit a lot of your milestones or just only a few. And so that's one of the big challenges of the life on Earth. So, you know, I, I think to ask the $1,000 question that most people would ask, and, you know, I don't know that anybody has uh, um, – trying to think how to explain it. I don't think anybody has the corner on really hard lifetimes, you know. But, you know, I guess the question based on my own life experience is, you know, it, it has been a process, at least for the last seven years, of being extremely hard. You know, some people would call it the dark night of the soul. I would call it the dark five years. <laughs> so, you know, I know there's a natural part of me that's joyful and and has happiness. And I guess I was wondering from all the things you've learned and from communicating with Albert, I mean, how do you bring more of that natural joy that's in you to the surface so that life can be um, a fun experience versus what feels like one trauma after the next sometimes? I mean, the main thing, according to Albert, is how you react to, to events, whether they were planned in your beforehand or happened by by free will. It, it's all how you how you, you react to things. And if you react in a positive way and understand that every challenge, every obstacle, uh, you know, every setback that you face, there's a lesson to be learned. Um, and if you have that sort of attitude, then you're going to be, you're going to have a, a happier life. You're going to, you know, it's going to be glasses half full, not half empty. Uh, and, and so it's, it's really a matter of your reaction, your attitude to what happens to you. Um, and that can, and, and the, the knowledge that you have that these things are all just learning experiences. And at the end of the day, you don't take any of it with you. You don't take any of the hardships or any of the scars that you had on earth you don't take that with you to the next uh, to the spirit side. You just take the memories and the and the wisdom that you learned from those lessons, um, and it's just all you know. As, as Albert said, it, 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 look at it as an adventure. It's hard to do that when you're having a uh, you're, you're into a, a rough period, but y you know you have to just change your attitude and be positive about it, and then then all of a sudden things will just look up and they'll start to look better, and your and your life will be more joyful. Mm, thank you for that, Dr. Connie. Um, I appreciate, again, what you said about going in and meditating because it appears that there's a, a certain amount of intention, purpose, mindfulness, and uh, it, it takes work to settle yourself enough to listen to your guides so that you, when, it, when, you know, when they say turn left, you're, 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 you turn left. Um, so does Albert have any um, ideas on, uh, uh, how is that, um, you know, because we, we get so busy and we're rushing and we're doing, we're on the, we have a million things on our to-do list of, of being able to stop and, and, and center oneself so we can connect. He just says that you should meditate at least twice a day. Um, and it doesn't have to be long. I mean, even 10 or 15 minutes is good. If you can do longer, that's great. Um, but he says that the more you do this uh, and the better you become at it, then you'll begin to hear more clearly the messages from your guides, not just during the meditation, but you'll recognize the messages as you go through life. And, and the, right. the, the real challenge is, is to figure out whether when you get a thought in your mind, is that coming from my guide or is that coming from my mind, my ego? Uh, and, and, and he said... That, it's difficult to tell, but if it, he says that if, if the message or the decision feels right in your heart, that's coming from your guides, uh, and 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 that's uh, and you, that's usually the first reaction you get is what what's in your heart, and then of course your mm -hmm. mind gets into the jumps into it and tries to rationalize it and tries to decide well is this really a good course of action for me? Oftentimes your mind will convince you that it's not, and so you end up ignoring the message. So it's, it's really a challenge. One of the biggest challenges that we have as a human on Earth is is trying to discern our messages from our guides. Mm, thank you. So, you know, <clears throat> before I get too far ahead of myself, <laughs> I got like a hundred questions for you already, but um, why don't you go ahead and give out your website and, um, and tell us what the name of your, uh, you know, so people can find out more about you and all your books. Sure. My website is uh, Garnet Schulhauser.com, which is hard to remember, but if you, if you, uh, Google Dancing on a Stamp or uh, the titles for any of my books, you can get to my website. And there, there's information on all of my books. You can read a synopsis, download a free exit, 
Um, you can uh, there's buy links there to all the popular online bookstores like Amazon and Barnes and Noble and so on. So you can just click on those and get right where you can buy my books. Um, I have uh, the recordings posted on my website, the recordings of all the radio shows I've done already. And this is radio show number 130 for me. And so you can listen to as many as you want. Thank you. Um, and um, you can also tap into my social media sites like Facebook and, and LinkedIn and uh, YouTube. And so there's a, just a wealth of information there. Um, the, the titles of all my books, the first one is, is Dancing on a Stamp. The second one was Dancing Forever with Spirit. The third one was Dance of Heavenly Bliss. And the latest one, which is due out in the next couple of weeks, is called Dance of Eternal Rapture. And uh, on my website, is my, uh, there's a, my email address is set out. And if anyone wants to send me a comment or a question, I certainly welcome, uh, love to hear from you. Uh, that's beautiful. And for anybody who might not uh, might have missed um, any of his links or anything like that, if you go to our website, which is uh, spiritualconnectionsradio.com, um, all his links for all his different media, social media and everything are listed there. So feel free to get there. But uh, I'll have to be honest with you. Most of the time when I'm looking for you, I do go out to Google and just put in dancing on a stamp. <laughs> exactly. That's the easy way. Yeah. 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 So here's here's an interesting question for you. I, I was kind of just reading a little bit about your Dance of External Rapture, which is your book that's coming out in the next two weeks. And you said during that that you had a chance to kind of have some encounters with Muhammad, Buddha, Mary Magdalene, and Jesus. And I guess the question I had for you, and I actually had to research this so I could kind of phrase this question correctly. Um, since you've actually met Jesus, um, I was looking at, and I actually have the picture of Jesus uh, in my living room, a copy of it. But there was that, Luther, that Lutheranian girl, um, I think her name was, I'm just kind of looking at now, but she actually died and came back when she was four years old. And she actually painted what she saw as Jesus. And um, I'm just looking to see what her actual name was. I think it was Akrina, and her last name was K-R-A-M-A-R-K. Um, have you actually seen her painting of Jesus? I don't think I have, Mark, no. Uh, okay. I was just wondering what, what your impression was when you met Jesus, and if it, it actually compared to her her painting at all. But, you know, hers was... A, a gentleman with a very powerful set of blue eyes and not the biblical Jesus that we're so used to seeing out of the church. Yeah, no, I haven't seen that, but I'm curious. And so uh, maybe after the show, you can send me that, that name and I'll look it up and have a look at it. Yeah. Yeah. So what was it like meeting Jesus? Well, it was very, uh, it, it was wonderful. Actually. He's, he's a very, as you can imagine, very wise, compassionate, um, uh, you know, loving soul. Um, and, and he he basically said, you know, um, I was he was a master soul, and, and the, the council of wise ones asked him to incarnate like a couple thousand years ago in, in, into the into the human body, Jesus Christ, and uh, and he did so, um, and he said that uh, um, he uh, he he knew that he was on a special mission. He he was allowed to remember a lot of why he had come there, and so he was so he had he had the the, the benefit of sort of knowing you know what his mission was on earth. Um, and he said that he, uh, after he, in the so-called lost years, he actually went to Tibet uh, to uh, study under a Buddhist monk, and there he learned to hone his skills, uh, and so he was able to be, basically focus his thoughts into very powerful beams of energy, which is how he performed his miracles, you know, like walking on water and turning water into wine. And, and he performed those miracles. Uh, he, he did that to attract attention. He was deliberately trying to get more people to notice him, to follow him, because he wanted to spread his message of love and compassion and forgiveness for humans, which uh, at that stage it was felt they really needed a bump up to get on the get organized on these on the, the ladder to spiritual enlightenment. And so that was his mission. Yeah. He uh, he did say that uh, you know he was he was uh, he realized that there would be a, probably a religion organized after he died, uh, but he didn't know how it would pan out. He said, for the most part, he, he thinks there's been a lot of good things done by the Christian church following his death. He was dismayed, though, at, at, at some of the things that where they'd gone off track. Um, and, and this is just because the leaders that followed him, uh, they had their own agendas. They were sort of more concerned with power and control than spreading his message. And so the, the church kind of got off track in a number of places. Um, and uh, so he was dismayed at that. He, he really felt it was really too bad that they had... That, 
decided to go down the avenue of using guilt and fear to control people, especially the fear factor. You know, like when I was raised as a kid, there was the concept of hell. You know, if you if you sinned and didn't make amends and you died, you'd go to this awful place called hell forever. Uh, so it was really a scary concept. And he said that that he no way wanted uh, his religion to scare people into doing what what was good. He wanted them to do so willingly once they understood what his message was. And so he really disagreed with this the, the scare tactics, uh, and he wished they they hadn't done that because it causes people a lot of anguish. Um, the, the other thing he confirmed, which I had heard before um, through Albert, was that uh, he was in fact married. He married Mary Magdalene. They had three children, um, and uh, that, that that fact has been edited out way back when out of the scriptures. Originally, it was in there, and the the, 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 the church leaders decided that it was better for him to be single and celibate because that somehow uh, made him more of a godlike figure without having been sullied by having sex with a wife. Uh, so that's why they did that. Uh, and they didn't want to have him having any children uh, so that there'd be any question about like, who's the descendant of Jesus. And so they, they changed all that. Um, but he said, no, yeah, he was married, had children. Um, when I asked him why he allowed himself to be crucified on the cross, because with his powers, he obviously could have avoided that. And he said, yeah, he knew he could do that, but he wanted to make a more dramatic statement for his followers, so he let himself be crucified, and then, he, of course, he rose again on the third day, and, and that made a very uh, uh, very uh, important statement to his followers, and so he allowed that to happen. Uh, but he's, he's really, a, I mean, he came here just, uh, he's full of love. He came down here to help uh, humans and, and, and did his best, and uh, unfortunately, it didn't all play out the way he had wanted it in terms of how the church was structured, but he just know that, that that happens, you know, with humans on earth, Anything can happen, and, uh, and and I asked them, you know, would you like to come back? A lot of people w- were hoping for the second coming of Christ. He said, yes, he would like to come back and, and help us again, but it's, he said it's up to the Council of Wise Ones to decide when, if and when that happens. So um, that's where he stands, but uh, he uh, he's really, uh, you know, he's still really very much involved with what happens on Earth and really hopes that we can... Uh, we can straighten ourselves out and and, uh, and and move up the ladder to spiritual enlightenment. Mm, very cool. Dr. Connie? Is there a way that for those who have not seen um, a, a spirit or whatever in any form um, to be able to do that? Or is that only for people that chose to be able to have that ability when they uh, incarnated? Um, yeah, it, for the most part, uh, the the appearance of of spirits to people, a lot of that times that was pre-planned, either to happen or not happen. Um, so, it, it, and for the most part, a lot of, most people just don't get that opportunity, um, or sometimes they get the opportunity and they think that it's just a it's a ghost. You know, it's not. A sort of a good, mm-hmm. a good spirit, and so, so sometimes they get very frightened by it, um, and, and mm-hmm. so it sort of varies all over the place. But there's there's a whole lot more people, Connie, who have seen apparitions and spirits than who actually admit it. Uh, so there's quite a few people who do, um, and most of the time they're not, a, not not really aware of what what it is and, and what that they're seeing, and uh, uh, and a lot of times it's not a very welcoming experience. So it it sort of varies, goes all over the map. Mm. And it would be very easy to dismiss if someone, you know, had a, um, were meditating and saw somebody, you know, um, to, it would be easy to dismiss that unless they had a um, a real firm belief that what they're seeing is actually true. Yeah, you know, that's, I think that's right. It's easy it, to exactly. It, it, people who are aware that they have spirit guides. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and they, they have, there's angels and there's uh, you know all kinds of different uh, entities that could, might appear in your life. If they are if they're open to that sort of uh, uh, sighting, uh, then they will be better able to deal with it and think, okay, well maybe this is a guide or maybe it's one of my angels or uh, or somebody else that's coming to to, to give me a message. Uh, but if they're not open to that, then it could be a very frightening experience, and you know right. they, they might think I'm hallucinating or this is a ghost right. or you know what do I do with this. So it depends on no, the person and how open they are. I, I actually had a person uh, tell me one time that they believed that people that had um, schizophrenia that 
one of the reasons that they did is because they were so connected with the spirit world, they couldn't filter out all the voices and all of the uh, everything that they were seeing. That's exactly right. And in fact, I, I, in one of my trips, and I think it's in my second book, we actually went to a, a mental institution where this uh, lady had been uh, institutionalized and she was labeled as a schizophrenic. But it, it, Albert told me that's exactly what happened. She had a, a, a bit of an orphan portal into the spirit world and other dimensions, and she was so entranced by what was going on in these other dimensions and in the spirit world and what she could see that it kind of interfered with her life here on Earth as a human. And so they labeled her as schizophrenic and locked her up. So that does happen to a lot of people. They're just really yeah. very absorbed in the other things, spirits, uh, entities that they're seeing that other people can't see. And so it's uh, they're sort of in their own world. That's cool. That's very cool. Yeah, very cool. So, you know, you've 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 had all these different experiences working with Albert and everything like that. Um actually just a side question before I get into this. Um as you're as you're doing the interview and everything, is Albert actually talking to you? No. No, he doesn't no. he doesn't sort of he's not there talking to me or coaching me. No, he doesn't do that. So I'm so basically uh -huh. on my own. <laughs> and and <laughs> occasionally sometimes after an interview when we have a conversation he'll tell me where I've should have said this rather than that kind of thing, but no, he doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't distract me as we're going. You know? Oh, it, okay, it, very fact, cool. I wish, I wish, I wish that he would, because then I wouldn't make so many mistakes. But, uh, but no, he's he lets me go on on my own on these things. Uh, okay, very cool. So, I, you know, the the question I was heading towards is, you know, I noticed. You know, and I know from reading all your books and everything like that. And for anybody you're not who's not familiar with his books, of course, you can start by googling the first one, which is Dancing on a Stamp. Um, I highly recommend that. I personally, and I know me and Garnet were kind of talking about it at the beginning of the show. I actually love his audio books because he actually does the voice um, for it. But Garnet was kind of sharing with me that that's a that's a lot of work to do the audio books. But um, he does have a book out, which is one of his audio books. But, um, you know, you could start with his first book, which is Dancing on a Stamp, which is just amazing. I mean, all of your books. And, you know, I, I want to kind of take a moment to just say thank you for being of service and, you know, really bringing um, this material out to everybody. I think it answers a lot of questions that people have about life and answers a lot of questions about some of the challenges we have and some of the questions that we've always had. So thank you for, for being of service. You're welcome. And, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to do this because Albert uh, really brought a lot of comfort to my life in terms of who I was and why I'm here and what ha especially what happens to me when I die kind of thing. And uh, and, and so I, 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 I really uh, want to spread that message to other people because I know a lot of people – uh, who are maybe disaffected, you know, uh, Christians or other religions, and they're sort of wondering, like, w what's this all about? Why am I here? You know, is there a hell? You know, does uh, does God manipulate things? Uh, you know, am I a sinner? That kind of thing. And they and they really, hopefully, will get some comfort out of hearing what Albert has to say about all that. And then from there, with that sort of burden lifted off their shoulders, they can sort of go forth for the rest of their lives and hopefully, uh, uh, you know, uh, enjoy the enjoy the adventure. When you're, when you're buried mm -hmm. and burdened by all these doubts, it's not really an adventure. Mm -hmm. It's really treachery, right. and it's really, uh, it, it can be really, uh, really depressing. So hopefully yep. my books will help these people. Yeah, so thank you for that. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, on my own spiritual journey over the last eight years, um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of experiences and I've learned a lot of things, but I think one of the biggest gifts that was given to me through that process was really – understanding the big picture you know understanding kind of like what you said in the beginning that we're a spirit that lives forever and that we're just here having a human experience on earth um and there's there's a lot of you know for me i think you know through life i always had faith but i don't think it was until i went through and you know i have a very strong background in different religions and stuff from my upbringing and all the way through to my teenage years and when I got older, when I was going to college and, um, you know, you always have faith in everything, but it was spirituality that brought me the truth to show that, you know, there is God, there is, you know, all these amazing, 
um, things in life that are there to support us and everything like that. And, and I guess for me, uh, it allowed me to know the truth that everything is exactly what I thought it was. And, um, you know, it didn't leave me with any doubt or questions and stuff like that. And, um, it really, uh, also kind of brings it into a larger picture of just really understanding that everybody on the earth is of the same tribe, you know, and, we don't have to make things about difference or fear. And, you know, from that really understanding that there's a larger responsibility as an individual having this experience for me to kind of love every person I come across instead of trying to make it about a difference. Yeah. Well said, Mark. Yeah. That's, that's clearly what we all have to focus on. Once we realize that we're all souls who are all connected to the, to the source, to God and to each other, and we're just having journeys in different human bodies, then we can sort of, like you say, set aside the differences and, and don't worry about somebody speaking a different language, has a different color of skin, um, or different customs, or worships a different god. Then those differences will just disappear, and you recognize everyone on this planet as a soul, just like you, with their own challenges and their own uh, lessons to be learned. And if we could all do that, uh, we're going to have a much happier place to live in. Mm, very nice. Uh, Dr. Connie? Well, just kind of going along with that, um, there's just no room for judgment and criticism. There's just no room for it. You know, to take everyone as they are and not put a personal label on them um, is what I'm reminded of a lot, that that everybody is doing what they're what they're doing and where they're at at the time and it's all a growth it's all a growth curve for everyone um so it's just it's just it's just more about love and compassion and and you know bringing them in and holding them um in a sacred space as opposed to pointing a bony finger um which is one of the one of the biggest shifts for me so um Uh, on a on a completely different note, which one's your favorite book? Which is my favorite book? Uh-huh. Um, I can't really pick it, Connie. It's like asking me wh- wh- who's my favorite child. <laughs> I can't. I don't okay. have a favorite. I like them all. You know, to be honest, I like them all. They all have a they all have a different message. Um, I think that in terms of my abilities as a writer, I think that that each book I, I became a little bit of a better writer. And so I think the fourth book is, is better written than the third and third better than the second and so on. Uh, but that's just in terms of my, my, my judgment as, as to how I am as a writer. But I think the messages mm-hmm. are all equally good. They're, they're different. Sometimes there's the, the, the same message is being reinforced in a different way from a different soul on the spirit side. But uh, it's all good. And so I, I really don't have a favorite. But I, I do think that uh, uh, m- the last book is the best written of all, of all three, of all four rather. So we'll just better and better, right? I sure hope so. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. I don't know. I, I enjoyed your first book, so you know, if they get better from there, <laughs> it's nothing lost. <laughs> um, you know, without going into too much detail about each of the books, I mean, is there a general theme as far as going from the first to the fourth? Um well, the, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the general theme is, is basically what I said at the beginning in terms of what the, what the broad picture was, and then uh, each of the books then carries that theme forward and brings in further detail from different people when I go to different places and talk to different souls on the spirit side, like, you know, Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, um, uh, you know, and I've gone to different planets to, to, to see how other human civilizations exist. Like, like humans don't just exist on Earth, they're on other planets. And, and, and it's an eye-opener to see that other civilizations, human civilizations, have, have done things differently. They don't have all the violence and negativity that we have on Earth. Uh, they, they run things differently, and they have very, very happy uh, uh, civilizations. And so that's good for us to know that, um, you know, our human civilization, it doesn't have to be this way. There are other humans that have done things differently and are enjoying better lives. And so that's really to me, an encouragement that it's not something inherent in humans everywhere. It seems to be a particular trait of 
of, what, of humans on our planet that we have trouble sort of getting rid of our negative emotions and, and we end up having too much violence and, and abuse and wars and all the other things that have happened in our history right, you know, right from day one. And so it, it, it's, good for, it, it's good for us to know uh, that things can be better. Um, and so, the, you know, it, every person I talked to, every place I went to was sort of to reinforce the, the, the message that humans, we have to change our ways. We can by embracing love and compassion and forgiveness. Um, and other people have done it before us, and we should just follow suit. And, and so there is hope for us. We're at, a, we're at a very crucial stage of our development, as the Council of Wise Ones has told me. You know, we have uh, very advanced technology. We have weapons of mass destruction. Um, and, but our spiritual and emotional intelligence is not kept pace. And so if we're not careful, we can end up destroying all life on our planet. And they don't want that to happen. They want us to sort of get over this, this hump that we're on and, uh, and, and move forward up the spiritual ladder. So, so all, all the books sort of have the same theme is that, yeah, human, humans, you know, this is who you are. This is where you're going. Um, and this is how you can help yourself. Um, you know, become a, a better person initially and a better civilization. And it's just to, to help us all understand, uh, you know, where we should be moving from this point forward to, to make sure that we don't destroy everything on our planet. Um, you know, even though, you know, if that happens, we all go back to the spirit side, but they really want a human civilization on planet Earth to survive and, and, and thrive and, and, and get over all the violence and neglect and abuse that, that, that happens on our planet every day. So... It, it's all all these books sort of fill in the gaps and give people more detail, uh, more food for thought, more things to think about in terms of what has already happened on our planet and and how we can change things. Mm. I, I know that you talked about you know Jesus coming back based on a decision by the Council of Wise Ones. I've heard you say that uh, the Council of Wise Ones kind of. Um, decide a lot of different things, can, you know, not going into too much detail, but can you kind of talk about the, the Council of Wise Ones for a minute? Sure. They're a, a, a committee of sort of very wise and advanced souls that have a, had a lot of personal experience on Earth and incarnations, and so they sort of know what's going on in the planet, and so they're there to basically oversee the incarnations on planet Earth, um, and, and they're there to help souls who are sort of planning to jump into a, an incarnation. They will uh, look over their life plan, and they'll make comments, give them advice, um, especially they, they don't want people, like especially new souls, to, to jump into too many difficult scenarios. In other words, not to bite off more than they can chew because it doesn't end very well. And so they're there to sort of provide guidance, and they do that, and, and, and it's good, but they don't dictate what you have to put in your life plan. You have the final decision, but they'll give you some good advice. And so and because of all their experience, they know exactly when, by looking at your life plan, you know, is it suitable for you at your stage of development, or is it uh, uh, too easy, or is it too difficult? And so they're, they're an invaluable source of information, and I've watched a few planning sessions where they've had some input, and it's really quite amazing. Mm. You know, this, this question is a little bit like what Dr. Connie had asked, and that is, um, you know, from all your different books and everything like that, basically going back to your experiences, which is what's in the writing of the books, what is one of your most memorable experiences? I guess specifically ones related to traveling to other dimensions or other planets, and why why was it your favorite? Um, well, one of the favorite ones was a was a trip to a planet called Gamma, many light years away, where there's a very advanced human civilization, um, and they had uh, they had no violence, no conflict, no crime. Uh, the reason for that is that they had their scientists had discovered a long time ago that uh, negativity, negative emotions in humans was the result of a defective gene, and so they'd managed over a period of time to, to engineer genetic, genetically engineer that that gene out of humans. And so at that stage, they 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 were just sort of very peace loving, uh, lived in harmony, as I say, no crime or violence. So it was a wonderful sort of civilization. And they had also, amazingly, they had, they had realized that um, one of the things that humans like to do, and they were humans, is that they like to in, enjoy good food and drink and so on and have fun. And so they decided that rather than try to do away with that, they came up with uh, what he, he, they termed a diet pill, which basically a miracle pill, which meant that you could take this pill and then eat whatever you wanted to, decadent food, and you would not gain an ounce of weight. And so it was one of those amazing things where they spent a lot of time you know, eating and drinking, and they had uh, no weight gains. They were all slim and fit and in and, uh, and, and great health. And, and because they had learned to slow down the aging process and, uh, and to, to deal with uh, 
uh, you know, injury and disease. They all live for several hundred years. It was a very wonderful sort of existence, very peaceful, um, and uh, it was just, it, to me, it just said, you know, this is where our civilization could go. It was really quite amazing, and, and, and I wish that, you know, I could be there, but not to be so, so I had to go back to Earth, but it was really, it was really one of the amazing trips I had, which is described in my fourth book. Mm. Hey, do you have, did you bring back any of those diet pills when you came back? I want some. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, yeah, I wish I could. I wish I could because, uh, and I and I said that to Albert, you know, is there any way we can get some of those? He said, no. Uh, he said, it, it's not, you know, you're going to have to wait until your, your scientists develop one of those, uh, you know, on, on your own. We're not going to give that to you. Um, but he says, you know, if it makes you feel any better, when we get back to Earth, I'll buy you a double cheeseburger. <laughs> That's funny. Very, very cool. Uh, Dr. Connie? So Earth has the potential to be able to evolve if enough souls will hold, um, will, will shine the light and get a critical mass um, developing what I'm hearing you say is that Earth could evolve to that. Yeah, absolutely we can. There's certainly the potential, um, and it's just a matter of, as you say, we have to get enough people thinking in the right way, getting a critical mass of people who are spiritually enlightened, who understand that we have to love, uh, embrace love and compassion and forgiveness totally, and if we do that, all the negative aspects of our uh, that happens on Earth, like the, the fear, anger, hate, greed, and and all the violence that results will just disappear if we can get enough people to, to embrace love and compassion. And that's really what we have to do. And it's not an easy job, but mm -hmm. we have to do it sort of one person at a time. I mean, uh, you'll mm -hmm. start with yourself and then, and then convince your family members to do likewise, and then your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers. And it can sort of ripple out if we get enough people doing this. But we do have the potential, mm -hmm. but we have to be careful that we don't end up destroying ourselves uh, before we get there. Right. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, I'm certainly on board. I'll do all I can. <laughs> mm. So, Garnet, you know, I, I know you just finished the book, so I hate to even ask this question, but are you thinking about another book? Um, yeah, not not in any uh, concrete sense. Uh, 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 Albert is, uh, I asked Albert after I finished the, the manuscript of the fourth book about uh, the book five, and, and he said, "Yeah, there, there will be a book five, but he said I need to take a break from the writing for a period of time." Um, and so he said, uh, he, "He basically said, I'll I'll tell you when the time is right, and and we'll go on another adventure, and and book five will be off and running." So I don't know when it's going to happen. He won't tell me. He's very inscrutable mm -hmm. at times, um, and so I just have to wait for him to tap me on the shoulder and say, "All right, let's go." Yeah. And I, I think I think from the previous interviews you kind of shared that that um you know going from one book to the next you he would kind of disappear for a while cuz you know his his guidance really was about you know getting the information the books out so he wasn't like one of your main guides per se he was kind of like one of your book guides and because of that he would come and then you wouldn't know when he was going to be coming back and then he would appear and then it would be time to write another book. Yeah, he definitely had his own agenda for me, uh, and he wouldn't tell me ahead of time, uh, you know, what was going to happen or where we're going or when he's coming back. Although he did tell me uh, early on that uh, when I was writing the first book, he said, you know, you're you're going to write, you know, at least four or maybe five books, uh, you know, which was a bit overwhelming for me at the time. But it, as it turned out, uh, they just all played out nicely. Uh, but he's very uh, very close-lipped about exactly what he has in mind for me, which. I guess in some senses that's good because if he, if he laid out too much ahead of me, I might be overwhelmed. So he gives me, you know, a, 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 a piece here and there, you know, when I'm ready for it. Mm, very cool. Dr. Connie? Um, so are you, I know that in, in Neil Donald Walsh's book, he says that he was, it was like a channeling. He didn't even know he was writing. Do you have that to a degree at all, or do you just um, are you very aware from the first, you know, sentence to the last? Yeah, no, I, I'm not. To, I, I don't channel when I'm writing. What happens is that, uh, well, in the first book, when I had the dialogue with Albert, I would 
when we were ch chatting, I would make notes on a notepad, and then when we were finished, I'd go to the computer and sort of write out the notes, and then that eventually developed into the manuscript. And on my astro mm -hmm. trips, um, I, uh, w when I wake up the next morning, the, the, the visions and the images and the conversations I had on my trips are very vividly in my memory. And so I would go to my com computer and basically write down my recollections of what I saw and what I did and who I spoke to, and then that formed the, the basis for my next books. And so I wasn't, when I'm writing, I don't think I was really, well, I guess channeling to a certain extent, all, all authors channel to some degree when they're writing. I wasn't aware that I was channeling, but, but uh, uh, you know, probably there was some, uh, some channeling going on. And in fact, one of my trips uh, to Spirit Side, um, I met what Albert referred to as one of my writing coaches, which was uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the, the man who wrote the Sherlock oh, Holmes cool. series. Yeah, sure. So, so I was quite interested to meet him, and he said, yeah, I'm your writing coach, and I do send you thoughts uh, here and there when... Uh, when you're writing, but it's not sort of like automatic writing. It's it's more like I just right, right. thought pop into my mind when I'm writing. So and I'm very grateful for okay. that because I, yeah. Okay. Very cool. So I think for a lot of us, you know, we all want to have a stronger connection and and work with our our guides and everything like that. Do you have two or three ideas on what what uh, what a person can do to have a stronger relationship with their guide? Well, the, the 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 way to develop a stronger relationship is is to listen to their messages and and act on acknowledge that they're getting the messages because it, you know your, your guides can get a little bit frustrated if you if they're sending you messages all the time and you totally ignore them and don't even realize they're there and so they they they, they can sort of back off a bit on the messages but they get encouraged if you acknowledge that they're you're sending they're sending you messages and you act on it and so the way to do that is to is to be a better listener. Uh, you know, follow your intuition, follow your heart, because uh, those messages are coming from your guides, and then they they get encouraged, and they, they sort of get hepped up, and will keep on bombarding you with more messages. You know, given the fact that you are listening to us, and so that's how you can have a, a better connection: is listen to them and act on what they're saying. Mm, very beautiful. Thank you. Well, we really appreciate you being on the show, and as me and Dr. Connie always say, boy, an hour flies very fast. <laughs> it, it does indeed, and I. Uh, I thank you both for having me on your show. Uh, as, as, as before, Mark, it's always a delight to be on your show. Uh, and uh, hopefully if, if, when I finish book five, maybe we can do it again. <laughs> always, always, always waiting to hear from you and everything. appreciate you being on. Um, for anybody that's listening to the show, you can find out more about his new book that's coming out, which is Dance of uh, it, it, Eternal, Eternal Rapture. Rapture, right? And uh, if you're trying to find him, you can uh, Google him as Dancing on a Stamp, which was his first book. This is Garnet Schuhauser. He's been on the show over pretty much the last four years. Uh, we always enjoy having him on. And uh, if you need any of his social media links and everything, they are up on the radio website at spiritualconnectionsradio.com. And Garnet, thanks again for doing the interview. And thanks, Dr. Connie. Absolutely, Garnet. Thank you. It was a uh... A pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much. My pleasure, and thank you for inviting me. Yes, sir. All right. Good night, everybody. You've been listening to In the Arms of the Angels with Dr. Connie McNeil on Spiritual Connections Radio. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. <laughs>